Happy New Year, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. We're live again, and we're very excited because for the first time uh, in this session in 2022, we're welcoming our new members of the Sound United family, our colleague experts of Powers and Wilkins. So today we're going to walk you through the brand heritage and discuss the unique characteristics of the BMW product lineup and ending the session with the usual Q&A. So time for some introductions. Joining us today are Eric McBride, our premium audio brand manager for North America based in Reading, Massachusetts. We have Dave Nauber, our Class A brand director, dialing in from his home in Connecticut. And we have Andy Kerr, director of product marketing and communications based in Southwater, that's in the UK. We have Johan Katjert, brand activation manager, Europe based in Eindhoven, that's a lovely city in the Netherlands, neighboring Belgium and Germany. Welcome to the webinar, gentlemen, and thank you for being with us. Thank you for your time. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to our host and training guru, Phil Jones, who's joining us from his office in Karlsbad. Over to you, Phil. Hello, everyone. And I am a, totally excited to have this, um, to have this webinar. Um, I've always been a Bowers fan. And when um, I learned that um, Bowers was going to join the Sound United family, I was very, very, very happy. Um, as you can see, this is a, a global conversation, and we have people from all over the world here to talk about the Bowers brand. And I brought in the big guns, the people that can really talk about the history that have been there for a while. So, Andy, how are you? Very good. Thank you very much for taking the time to, to have me on this. It's much appreciated. Welcome, everybody, to, to joining us and hope you're going to find the next however long it is as interesting as, as possible. So, so Andy actually has a long history. <laughs> Andy, can you talk about your background with Bowers, you know, and, and what do you kind of do and, and, and things like that so that people can get a, a good understanding of who you are? So I'm, um, well, okay, approaching 30 years in the audio industry, um, prior to joining Bowers and Wilkins, I was actually uh, in audio journalism, I was actually an editor at a couple of publications in the UK, including uh, What I Fi, which I'm sure most of you have heard of. Um, and then I moved across to Bowers and Wilkins, well, quite some time ago now. Um, and I worked initially in product development as a product manager, so working uh, with the engineering teams at their then Stenning Research Establishment, SRE, uh, more recently Southwater. So, um, over time, I've kind of got used to doing some of this as well. I'm sure, as, as a lot of you guys have, we've we've all had to adapt and do this as well. So increasingly, I do not just product development, but the, the product marketing and product communication part. But I've basically been involved in uh, pretty much every major loudspeaker that we currently produce, with the exception of uh, Nautilus and CT800. There we go. That's a reasonable oh. track record. Awesome. And uh, and also, Johan has, ha has been with Bowers, and him and I are kindred spirits, along with Eric. Um, they are part of my uh, of my team, so you're going to see them a lot. So, Eric, talk a little bit about your background and what and what did you do for Bowers, and what are you going and what are you kind of uh, planning on? What are you doing now? Yeah, I'm uh, uh, worked for Bowers for nine years now. Uh, worked in the shop before that and started my career in in, in IT. So I have a little bit of an IT background, and that really helps uh, nowadays with all the streaming, uh, video, and audio uh, around uh, this time. Um, yeah, I looked after CI products most of my my days. So um, yeah, my level of expertise is mostly uh, yeah CI, custom install, home theater, and home control. So yeah, happy enjoy the. Happy to join the, the, the Sound United team and, uh, and work all together. Yeah, so so uh, the cool thing is I can always go to Andy and say, what's in the box? How does the box work and everything else? And then it's um, Eric and Johan and myself's responsibility to help you um, integrate. How do I get this in a room? What, you know, how, what's the best placement and things like that? And then what type of, you know, amplification is recommended? But we know what should go in, go with Bowers, right, Dave? What should go with Bowers? Class A. <laughs> exactly. So, so, yeah. so, so, um, so there's, it's our flagship brand and it's our, it's our, um, those are our two flag amplifier brand. Our flagship is Class A and our flagship speaker brand is Bowers. It's just the way it is. And they, they have a, we'll talk a little bit more about their history, um, together in a while. So Andy, can you, um, talk a little bit about the history of Bowers. Sure. So, um, I mean, the first question people always ask is, is why is it in Worthing, which is a relatively small town, if those of you don't know it, on the south coast of the UK. It's not too far from Brighton, which is probably 
somewhat more famous. Uh, and the answer is that the person who founded the company, uh, John George Frederick Bowers, was born here in 1922. Um, he grew up a kind of enthusiast of amateur radio. He became a kind of quite interested, um, what's called radio ham, uh, prior to the outbreak of the Second World War. Um, as soon as 1939 uh, and the war broke out, he enlisted in the army. And because of his knowledge and understanding of radio, he was recruited into the Royal Corps of Signals, which is uh, an element of the British Army that dealt specifically with radio still does. Now, from there, he turned out to be uh, very adept, very talented indeed. So he was taken from there into British military intelligence. At this point, people always go, I'm not sure I believe you, but genuinely that was the case. <laughs> um, he went from, from Royal Corps of Signals to um, a specific place called Wadden Hall, which is related to another more famous place called Bletchley Park. Some people may have heard of that. That was dealing with what's called the Enigma Code or cracking the code that allowed us to listening to our then enemies at the time. Uh, so Waddenhall's job was to communicate with resistance fighters and British spies. Um, because of that British intelligence, it actually fell under the control of MI6. So yes, the founder of Bowers and Wilkins uh, was in fact in the same organization as the <laughs> character James Bond, which clearly is a pretty cool story, but it also happens to be true. Um, so he met uh, Roy Wilkins, uh, his friend, at that time when his service and the two men during the course of the war decided that after the war they were gonna form a shop uh, essentially selling and specialising in their knowledge base, which is radio. And they started that pretty quickly. Uh, immediately after the war, they applied to, to form the company in November of 1945. And by August of 1946, it was up and running. And that was their business for the first 20 years. From 1946 through 1966, they were selling first radio parts. And then, of course, as the 1950s came along uh, and the emerging art of high fidelity stereo sound, as it used to be known, hi-fi as it became, came across. Um, they started stocking first records and record players and then amplifiers and then in the end, of course, loudspeakers as well. Um, and this is where it becomes interesting, right, because John is uh, was an extraordinarily sort of driven individual. He was the kind of person who wouldn't settle for second best. So he was a passionate music lover. He used to go to lots of live music concerts, particularly in the area. There were lots of opera concerts and so forth. He was big on classical music. And he was very disappointed by the sound that he was able to create from the audio systems of the time when he was replaying what he thought was the same piece of music in his front room. So he started looking at the loudspeakers that he was selling and finding ways to, to modify them to see if he could improve the sound. Eventually, it turned into something of a sideline business through 1964 and 65. So if you went to the store, you could either buy a stock pair of speakers or you could choose to buy a pair of modified Bowers speakers that were special. Um, now, everything changed in 1966, uh, and that's our great kind of pivot point moment for the company, uh, when a lady who had passed, uh, purchased a pair of those speakers unfortunately passed away. Uh, she was an opera singer. She was very much into her music, and she wrote into her will a considerable sum of money as a gift to John Bowers, but only on the proviso that he stopped working in the shop and started a loudspeaker company. So that's what he duly did. So from 1966 to 1969, they carried on making loudspeakers just in the same way as they've been doing it before. So modifying existing speakers in the back of the store, selling them through the front of the store. Uh, and then in 1969, John moved premises, moved to his very first factory and set up what would become eventually the Bowers and Wilkins that you know today. So BMW loudspeakers. And at that point, they started producing in quantity. Obviously, it became a much more industrialized operation than it had been to that point. And we were away, you know, with essentially you know, what we were to become, the kind of, you know, innovative, different, distinct and producing, you know, a whole range of different products. You know, what's interesting about that story? Um, if you look at the story, um, the, 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 the history of many hi-fi companies, there's kind of that same kind of theme about someone who's truly passionate about music and what was available to them was not to their level of expectation. And whether we're talking about Saul Morantz or Dave has talked about the story of class A. It's the same thing. You know, mm -hmm. what I had wasn't good enough to meet my expectations. So either I'll modify it or I will figure out a way to make a better product to meet my what I believe is my my um what I believe it should sound like. And and that's kind of a common theme. And that just kind of shows that these companies are started by people who are passionate. It's not about the money, it's about the music. And, and and all of our brands still maintain that. And and if you look at everybody that's part of this company, these companies, Sound United, and you talk to an Andy or a Dave or anybody or a Matt Lyons from from our um, Polk and Definitive Speaker divisions, you will see this passion um, for the product, and it continues to be a passion. We make 
our products to make great music. And then we want to share that music with others. Sound United. So so that kind of theme goes a long way. Because I love having that same conversation with Dave. And it was kind of the same thing. Um, guy wants to make something. He gets a guy that can back the money. They start making a little business. And it kind of, ex it kind of just moves on. And it and it explodes into a, into another business now. So they have this factory now. You guys are still designed and and several of your products are manufactured still in the UK, correct? Absolutely. So um, we've been through various different factory iterations in the UK. The building that I'm actually in right now is the um, the modern version of the building that you just saw just then. That's our original factory uh, in Desiga Road in the UK, mm -hmm. uh, founded in 1969. So we've moved from there to a variety of increasingly larger sites and then we moved to our current building in Dell Road which is literally about 500 feet from where I'm sitting right now uh, in 2001 and that's um, by far the largest premium loudspeaker manufacturing facility in the UK very possibly in Europe it's huge um, and it's where we produce our 800 series diamonds uh, it's where we produce our custom theater 800 range our CT 800 and of course it's where we also produce Nautilus Yes, and you still have your research facility um, in the UK as well. Um, so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, the Stenning facility we outgrew. I mean, when I started working at the company, there were there were 25 engineers working in SRE, which is pretty much the same as it had been since it was founded in 1981. The mm -hmm. building's pretty small. Um, Stenning, as those of you who have been there, I know Dave will be laughing about this. It, it's a kind of tiny <laughs> little. It's the kind of tumble down place, um, mm -hmm. and the building facility was kind of crammed down this tiny little road which I know particularly when we had guests from the US coming in used to freak them out because they were kind of how I can't even get a car down there how can how can you imagine that you know we could work down there? but um we were there for yeah a period of time 1981 through two years ago uh, we just outgrew it essentially so there were too many people I mean at one point it got so bad that like if you arrived at 8 a.m and then you had like a 12 o'clock meeting down at Dale Road and you wanted to get down, you know, in your car, you had to kind of move 15 cars in order to get your car out of the car park. It was just mm -hmm. ridiculous. So uh, in 2018, we moved to our new site in Southwater, which is it's still fairly close, but it's a, a much more modern, much larger building. Uh, and that has scope and space for us to expand way beyond mm -hmm. where we are if we need to. Yeah, I'm looking forward to making a field trip <laughs> to UK <laughs> and, and exploring a lot of these facilities because um, I'm an old audio. I'm an audio geek. I've always been into audio, and Bowers has always been a, um, a a dream of mine to own and play with. I've been actually hitting up Eric to for a pair of um, uh, what what are you at? Oh, 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 over there <laughs> to replace those with a pair of um of uh maybe some 805s. You know, I would love to have them. I'm jealous because I'm looking back behind um like a. Uh, Andy and and Frederick and everybody else. Everybody has powers but me, and I feel I feel I I feel left out. So I'm looking forward to to, to going to the factory, and 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 uh and um and and seeing how it's all done because I remember these. I remember being a kid riding my bike, um in the 80s um down to a the old hi-fi shop and looking at. These, these, some of these Bowers products mm -hmm. and looking at the old Stereophile magazine when it was a little itty bitty kind of journal size and saying one day, you know, I'm going to um, have a pair of these. And, um, and I remember these. And actually, if you look behind Frederick, um, Frederick, what do you have sitting behind you? Well, that's uh, 802 uh, Series 2 from 1989. Um, I've had them for about 10 years now. I inherited between quotes from the CEO of the previous company I was working for. He said his wife found them too big. Do you want, do you know anyone who wants them? Say, yeah, sure. Of course I would love to have those. <laughs> so, yeah, then, you know, 1989, the caps are getting a little old. So a technician friend of mine who was working in Hong Kong for Bowers and Wilkins suggested to recap all the caps in the serial. So I started doing that, swapping some components and upgrading. And we all suffer from upgrade because that's what that's what we do. That's what we're passionate about. And in the end, I just ripped the filters out and I just created my own from scratch, brand new. And it sounds really cool. It sounds really. I've got Mundorf caps in there and Mundorf copper foils for those who are familiar with. Now, now, Dave, these were kind of you had mentioned that these were kind of the first speakers that you actually uh, when you yeah. got out of college. So, yeah, it's really awesome. It's story? really awesome. I love this. Uh, I love this photo because it brings back so many memories. I, uh, my, my 
exposure to Bowers and Wilkins began at a hi-fi dealer in uh, Champaign, Illinois, Glenn Ford's audio video, where I worked as a salesman while I was at university. And uh, he was a, a Bowers and Wilkins dealer, and we had 801s on display. And um, not only did I think they were fantastic sounding, but um, I thought they were huge. And um, <laughs> and by today's standards, they're really quite small. So every time I see a pair of these in a store or in someone's house, I I just I kind of chuckle to myself because I used to think how big they were, and now that they look really small to me when I when I see them uh, compared to what, what's out there today. But uh, anyway, love that speaker, and and it began a, a forty year love affair with Bowers and Wilkins. Yes, because and and one thing that uh, that's kind of unique about Bowers is the form follows function, which which um which Andy will talk about. There's a unique look to these, and there's a reason mm -hmm. for that unique look, and it just continues to to evolve. And it's funny the um the like like as Dave said, that speaker seemed big, but if you look at the ones behind Andy, they don't seem as big until you see them in person. And um, uh, one of the things about the design is it can make something that's larger look less large. Um, I didn't uh, when I when I was trying to help, um, and they're they got a little bit of weight to them. I remember trying to help Brendan um, um, uh, um, move his new 800s into his room. I'm glad that you put casters on the bottom, and <laughs> genius because uh, yeah. not, not having those on the bottom would be um, a work. And you could see that the there's there's a they continue to evolve and the, and there's a reason why they evolve and as you see there's always kind of that unique look where the the um the woofer and mid-range are in its own kind of decoupled enclosure which we'll talk about and that kind of there's kind of a philosophy on how this stuff is made and they get they're they're beautiful um, you know one of the so, things phil that, that that it's it, it really just kind of occurs to me as i see this uh this image um the two speakers on the right are um, 800s, um, just mm -hmm. the one on the far right is the D3, the newest one, uh, mm -hmm. but they're both the same model, just different different uh, um, series or different iterations. Mm -hmm. And the one on the right, um, it, it has an appearance of being actually smaller, you know, it just for all the reasons, the acoustical reasons why it's shaped the way it, it's shaped, it also, mm -hmm. I think, has an advantage in looking a bit smaller than the one that preceded it. Exactly, because um, yeah, because when you see them in the store, like um, and you see walk them when you see them in the store, they're um, it's a it's a pretty large driver if you if, um system. If you look at a normal speaker that would have this speaker configuration and this much um, um, in internal enclosure space, it would appear a lot bigger than this. And when you see them in a, on a store, they don't seem that big compared to like like Dave said, uh, other brands that would have the same um driver assortment in it they would be much much would seem they, those would seem to be a lot bigger but there's a lot of magic going on inside of this box now um one thing like um now there's a philosophy there's a quote that you guys always bring up uh, from um from bowers uh, from uh, mr bowers andy and i love mm -hmm. this quote could you kind of talk a little bit about what this quote you know, this is kind of the the thought process um, of Bowers, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so look, if you go back to um, particularly the emerging art of hi-fi stereo, there was a period of time where it was quite commonplace for engineers to essentially tailor the sound uh, of the products that they were producing to create what was regarded as perhaps a more commercially friendly sound. So the obvious example is they might try and accentuate the bass to make the product sound subjectively bigger particularly in a larger room or they might uh, depending on the character of the audience they might try and make it appear more warm and more relaxed through the mid-range which might be what mm -hmm. certain types of customer might want or the converse is they might try and make it sound more punchy and aggressive but again it depends very somewhat on the brand um, the outcome of that though of course is what you're producing is essentially an interpretation it's a flavor of what the artist intended the artist spends all this time working in the recording studio to create a certain tonality a certain character if you then change it, you're producing whichever brand of loudspeaker manufacturer you are, your interpretation of that performance. And John said, we're not going to do that. But go back to the foundation era of the company. One of the very earliest recruitments he made was a chap called Dennis Ward, who used to work for EMI. Um, subsequently, of course, down the line, that would be a great way for us to connect up with EMI Abbey Road Studios, mm -hmm. now just called Abbey Road Studios. So he was well aware right from the start about the importance of accuracy and sound. 
Another great friend of his was a chap called Peter King, uh, who was a BBC uh, World Service continuity announcer, had one of those very BBC kinds of voices, you know. Um, and again, BBC monitors, for those of you who are familiar with those, are again okay, kind of the regarded as the absolute paradigm of kind of neutral, accurate sound. So John said, that's what we want to make. The best loudspeaker is not one that changes the sound, gives you more. It's the one that loses the least possible amount of the original signal. So fundamentally, what goes in should come out uh, unchanged and uncolored. Now that has attendant risks because the obvious risk is if the recording's poor, the outcome is probably not a great sound. But the counterpoint to that is if you've got a well-recorded piece of music, you don't get a more realistic reproduction. And it's exactly that philosophy on sound that's so endeared us not only to you know the very discerning listeners across the world but also of course the recording studios such as Abbey Road and many others. Mm -hmm. The funny thing is you talk about radio. Andy you have a radio voice. <laughs> <laughs> it's so between between you two it's like <laughs> it might as well be a, a BBC or a broadcast. That's why we always have Frederick come in and do the thing he, that 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 voice. And and I love that whole philosophy about um um keeping it don't try don't try to add anything because yeah it's true I mean, it's the it's the old good old-fashioned loudness can, like people take their eqs back in the back in the 80s and make smiley faces out of them um uh it, you're not listening to the direct what the the artist's intent there was there's a certain amount of bass there's a certain they spend time and care to make it sound a particular way and the goal is to recreate that experience that the artist wanted you to hear um, I Makes always sense. say there's a difference between preference and and precision or 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 perfection. And um, and if you're looking for precision, and um, that is where Bowers comes in. It's and, and that's the reason why you see them in a lot of different um, a lot of different um, recording recording studios and. And, and things like that. So that's one of the reasons why you will see these in a lot of studios. And like I said, I love this thing too, this little statement. Can you talk a little bit about this statement? Cause it is kind of a, a, a strong point. Yeah, so music that will soon be heard everywhere is first heard through our speakers. If you think about um, a great many of the most important recordings to you, both stereo music recordings and uh, feature film music soundtracks, music scores, uh, the chances are most of those uh, pieces of music when they were laid down and recorded the very first time in the world that they were played back through any loudspeaker anywhere was through a pair of Bowser Wilkins 800 series loudspeakers being used in the monitor application in a recording studio. So I'll give you a perfect example of the room you're looking at right there. That's the control room in Abbey Road Studio One. Of course, we haven't always had the latest generation 800s in there, but we've had 800s in there for a very, very long time, going all the way back to 1980. So, for example, the very first time anybody heard the music score soundtrack to Return of the Jedi on 800s, Raiders of the Lost Ark on 800s, uh, Star Wars The Phantom Menace, Lord of the Rings, um, most of the Avengers movies, 1917, all on 800s. And that's just some examples, that's music scores in movie context, but there's lots of pieces of music as well. So we, we like to think we know how things should sound because our speakers were present when they were created. Yes, and that's a good point. Now, I um, another thing too is I love these photos uh, of of Abbey Road showing the different generations of of um, of Bauer's product. But also, um, this is that same room. And Dave, what is connected <laughs> to those to those to those Bau, um, to those Bauer's speakers? Yeah, so those are uh, Class A four hundred watt mono amplifiers, and. Um... Abbey Road bought 33 of those when those first came out. So you'll still see uh, you'll see Class A amplifiers in various studios at Abbey Road uh, to this day. So that's uh, that's just a good good shot of yeah, the vertically stacked as well in that room. Yeah, I was just going to say you'll notice also if you look very closely above the, the board there, you see there's a second amplifier on the left. It's a second amplifier below the the top amplifier. So each each uh, loudspeaker is powered by amp which is um, without question the best way to listen to uh, to these speakers. Probably yeah, it's, it's the best way to listen to any speaker because it takes two amplifiers and I love that. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> the reality is they do sound really good when they're powered by it. They sound great yeah. anyway, but powered by it is awesome. Yeah, it's so, what we so, English so like to call not messing around, right? <laughs> exactly. So let's talk a little bit about this because 
one thing we want to get across is whenever uh, um, another brand joins the Sound United family, um, people want to make sure that that brand still maintains its character and its and, and the vision of how that brand was done. And uh, and there's a couple things we could talk about at this point. First, let's talk about um, the relationship, the long term, that long relationship that Class A and Bowers have had. So, Dave, can you talk a little bit about Class A and then and how it how you and Bowers became um, were family, and then you became friends, and then you became family again. So, can you can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. The um, uh, the relationship began in about the year 2000, so it's been a, a, around 20 years ago. Um, the At that time, the chairman of Bowers & Wilkins, Joe Atkins, was interested in having a high-end electronics brand that could complement the 800 series loudspeakers. Uh, Rotel was already being distributed by B&W in, in many markets, and, um, and so the B&W group uh, had been formed. Um, but Rotel only went to a certain uh, level, and uh, Joe met a Canadian named Mike Vigliss, who at the time, he was one of the founders of Class A. Um, uh, and uh, at the time, although he was nearing retirement age, he was still a pretty energetic guy and uh, got along really well with Joe. And um, they started with a distribution arrangement where, uh, like Rotel, Bowers began distributing Class A. And then um, I was recruited in 2002 to be part of the succession plan for Mike. And my first um, job was to put together a Class A design team and then um, use that to develop a new generation of products for the 800 series. And that's what we call the Delta series. So these were, these were the first amplifiers that came from that. Um, we enjoyed a very long relationship since uh, subsequent to that. And um, Sound United purchased Class A in 2018. Maybe it was a bit of a scouting exercise to see if, uh, if they like Class A, maybe they'd buy Bowers. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's all uh, it's all come full circle. Um, you know, our amplifiers we've always used throughout that period of time. We've always used Bowers speakers to to um, uh, to voice the amplifiers and their, um, Class A amplifiers uh, at SRE and so on. So. Um, you, you know, you can really say that the uh, the products were made for each other. So you can use different amplifiers with a Bauer speaker, and you can you can play different speakers with uh, a Class A amplifier. But when they're used together, they make really good music. Exactly. So there's this match made heaven. An interesting story. So so we are building a brand new um, facility in San Diego for Sound United. It's going to be kind of the headquarters for all of our brands, so people can come and experience all of the brands um, together. Um, and we're we're building a, a two a, a a two channel room as well as a theater room. So I went to um, Eric McBride. I'm not sure if he's hiding. He can probably bring on his mic. His camera's acting up today because he's at home with his kids. But I went to Eric and I was like, Hey Eric, I want to put in a two channel system. What should I put in there? And he was like, Well, if you want to do something that's kind of this shock and awe, you know, you should put a pair of Nautiluses in there. And I was like, Great. And I was like, What should I drive it with? And he was like, Eight Delta Monos. And I was like, what? And I thought he was joking. And Dave was like, nah, nah, you know, eight Delta models. It sounds outrageous. It sounds great. And I was looking at this and the biggest challenge that we were having that I had and that was that we had was trying to find a stand <laughs> that would hold a thousand pounds of amplifiers to, to drive to drive the mains. But this is actually, and then um, and then the first day I met Eric. Eric, are you on the line? Unmic yourself. I'm on the line. I'm here. Okay. So <laughs> Eric was late to a meeting um, with uh, that I had with him the very first time that Eric and I met. Eric is the um, is basically the premium audio uh, manager for the U.S. He works closely with me. He's kind of my other tech guy, him and Johan. And he was busy doing an audition. So can you talk about that story about the audition um, and why you were late to that first meeting? Sure. Yeah. So uh, again, apologies for not having my camera on. My actual alarm in my house is going off right now, so I'll try to make this quick. <laughs> oh, but anyways, uh, yeah. So, uh, I had um, uh, a local client in the Boston area. He wanted to come up and listen to the Nautilus. And um, you know, typically when people come up to listen to the Nautilus, they just want to hear it. They're not really interested in buying it. But I, you know, I entertained it. 
he came up with his wife, uh, sat down and played my my first three cuts. Um, and it's and I could see his face change. You know, he was starting to really enjoy it. So then I kind of gave him the the control and he played a few more cuts. And then he stood up. And he's like, so what color do they come in? And I'm like, well, what color do you want? He's like, well, uh, I saw like a midnight like blue. Is that available? I'm like, sure. He's like, okay. So I'll take midnight blue for my house uh, in Situate, Mass. And you know what? I'll take another pair for my house in Florida. I'm like, excuse me? And he's like, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll take two pairs. So I'm like, okay. I'm like, what are you yeah. driving them with? He's like, what do you recommend? I'm like, walk into the 800 room with me. Yeah. And there happened to be some Delta Mono sitting right there. So I'm like, uh, I don't know, 16 of these? And he's like, all right. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So, you know, Andy, so Andy will tell you that, that – um, uh, since the Nautilus was designed, the technology has moved on a long way. Um, and uh, while that's true, I'll, I'll point out one thing, which is uh, also true, that you saw that there were two amplifiers connected to the 800s in Abbey Road. Um, each of these speakers requires four amplifiers, by default, making it a better speaker in my mind. <laughs> and, and, and that's and Andy. Why does it require? Because when I first heard this, it kind of blew my mind. Can you explain why? Now, this is a um, almost like it, it's. It, how would you describe the speaker? It was almost like a research project that that just to me it seems like it was something like build a Formula One race car and and we'll sell a few and then no people keep buying them. <laughs> you know. So can you kind of explain what this speaker is? Yeah, sure. So um, let's put it in context first and foremost, Phil, right? So 801 had been around since 1979. Um, subsequently, you had been, you know, increasing the most important now speaker in the portfolio as the, as the pinnacle model. So we produce and still produce 800 series models in, in relative quantity. I mean, these days we're producing, I'm going to say somewhere in the order of 7,000 pairs of, mm -hmm. of various models if you go across the whole portfolio per annum. Mm -hmm. uh, by contrast, typically Nautilus you make by hand somewhere between 20 and 30 pairs so it's it's always been uh, very distinct it's it was created at the behest of john very sadly john um, knew he was going to die uh, from terminal cancer inoperable in 1987 and pretty much his last request to his engineering team at sre was to try to make a loudspeaker that acoustically didn't sound like a loudspeaker and that's a very specific brief and it's important to understand it wasn't about hitting a sound pressure level target or hitting a given frequency response in a room. Those sorts of parameters are the kind of things that get given to something like an 808, if anybody knows that model, the guys in the US office have a pair, or the guys, things like 801s, or our CT800s. Nautilus was specifically designed to disappear. That was the job. I mean, the irony is, of course, it creates a shape that does anything but disappear, but acoustically, <laughs> its form and its shape is designed to essentially lose the effect of the cabinet altogether. Now, of course, any box, whatever that box might be, impart some sense of character to the sound of the drive unit lives in it and I, i'm sure most of you guys have seen me do this at some point you can even do that like this you can you can put yourself yeah. inside a box and as a result you create some form of character to the sound so the idea of nautilus was minimize all of the edges around the cones separate them out into discrete enclosures which is why there are four discrete enclosures have no material change between any one of the cones in this in the structure so if you think about the modern generation 800 series, it has a diamond high frequency, it has a continuum mid-range cone, it has an air of low frequency cone. In a Nautilus, all the cones are the same. They're all aluminium. Aluminium, so we're British, you guys can cope with that. Um, and they also, <laughs> deal, they also operate the same way. They're all pistonic. Whereas in, uh, in an 800 series, we have a pistonic high frequency, a flexible mid-range cone, and a pistonic base cone. In Nautilus, it's all the same. And in order to make that work, uh, it uses an external crossover structure. So it's a semi-active design. So each cone is controlled and actively driven. So unlike uh, something like an 800, which you could in theory drive with, as Dave said earlier on, just a stereo amp, but two amps are better, right, Dave? Um, right. <laughs> a Nautilus, uh, you, you need or require an amplifier channel per cone in the structure. And of course, because there are four cones, that means four amp channels per speaker, which essentially means eight amp channels overall. And then, okay. As I said, two external crossover units, one per speaker, creating a complete system. So it's it's not exactly um, simple or trivial to set up, to say the least. Exactly. So let's quiz Dave because he's pretty because he has a history. Dave, why does it have the um, the uh, why is the shape the, the, like the, the 
Yeah. Yes. So, so, yeah. so then Andy can give him, Andy can grade him yeah, after. Andy can, can critique my uh, my explanation <laughs> of this. Um, if you imagine uh, how a loudspeaker makes sound going in and out, um, you can kind of put yourself inside of the loudspeaker enclosure and realize that there's just as much sound coming off the back of the driver as there is coming off the front. And uh, there's a lot of work that speaker designers do to um, absorb that reflection so that uh, it doesn't bounce back and hit the back of the, of the cone and cause a distortion. Um, this was a very advanced and, and I think um, innovative way to address that, uh, where by there is no back, uh, there is no place for the, the sound to bounce off and, and the energy is basically turned into heat. And you can see that for the, the high frequency driver, uh, the tube goes back a certain distance, but as, as you get down lower in frequency, the tube has to keep getting longer and longer and longer. And ultimately you get to the woofer and the tube is so long, uh, I forget exactly the, the length, 13 plus feet, um, uh, it's, it becomes impractical to do uh, just a straight tube. And so the tube is, is coiled on itself, which ultimately gives it the look of a, of a snail or, or um, the reason that you would call it the Nautilus. Yeah, that's pretty Andy, good. does yeah. he pass? <laughs> yeah, he passes. That's pretty good. Yeah, it's it's just it's exactly right. It's a reverse horn, essentially speaking. So if you want to make something louder, you use a horn. Uh, as of course, certain speaker brands do, and things like air raid sirens and so forth. They, you know, they use a horn structure. This is a, a reverse horn, so it's a horn on the reverse face of the cone. And as Dave just said, what that's doing is essentially controlling the energy of the drive unit on what's called the recovery phase. So as the cone's doing that, and of course, this is the back of the cabinet. And as Dave just said, if you move the back of the cabinet further away then the recovery phase of the cone has got less structure to pressure into and the tube lengths vary exactly right mr lorber as the structure gets larger because the cones get larger so there's more air pressure inside the system so you need a longer tube yeah, the good. funny thing about it is the reason why dave probably knows this is because he's done demos with these speakers you know, so many I, times people kept I, saying why does it look like that why did, and he's heard it from probably andy or the team for bowers so many times it has been programmed into him true. It's true. well you know just speaking of that speaking of demos there was a there was a time when we were doing um a tour of the united states with um uh with the nautilus and, and uh, class a amplifiers and uh, doing public events and i, I remember um I remember standing off to the side, uh, controlling the music and listening, and and uh, uh, for the first time in my life, you know, you think realize how expensive this loudspeaker is, and for the first time in my life, I'm standing off to the side and I'm saying to myself, I wonder what my price would be on these. <laughs> so it was like, yeah, it was, it was sounding really good. It was really good. Yeah. So uh, the yeah. fascinating thing about them, Phil, is they're, they're still made by hand now, right? So they, they're produced for us. Um, now we produce them actually in, in Dale Road in the UK. For a long time, they were produced for us by a local company, the cabinet shells themselves. It's actually three complete sections. So it's a left side, a right side, the two come together, and then there's a front section that the cones go in. So the first thing, of course, the guys have to do is, is manage away those edges from the three sections to kind of get it all smooth. That takes just an absolute ton of time sanding by hand to create those smooth surfaces. Um, then it's painted and you have to paint Nautilus completely by hand. There's no robotic painting. Uh, hence, of course, by the way, the reason why we can offer it in any color that you like, of course, if Sarah's prepared to pay. Um, and then they have to be polished by hand as well. Um, and a good friend of mine uh, in the factory, Nick, takes roughly three days uh, per cabinet to polish um, completely by hand. So they arrive to him painted but dull and then he produces that incredible uh gloss finish so it's like six days per pair of just literally polishing yeah it's um, it's, so it's a bespoke speaker and it's funny it's yeah. uh it was designed as a a passion project and um and you and people keep wanting to get them <laughs> you know so 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 uh and as long as a cus as these customers desire them um i'm sure that uh they and they're willing to um to pay the premium for them and they'll and they can hand make them in the factory they'll continue to hand make them so so these are a unique beast it just kind of shows uh like i said we talk about a passion passion projects we do this because of the love of music company taking six days to polish a speaker means that they actually really love making speakers and that's this is just another example of it so 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 this is an extreme example of combinations but you'll see a lot of times like 800s and class a go together like peanut butter and jelly in the u.s but 
Um, and also, we have our other brands have a very, very long history with with Bowers. So, so in um, Japan, Sal United has been the distributor of Bowers for a while. I know, especially starting with with Dennett and Morant. And if you go to our, we each we have what are called Sound Masters at Sound United for each of um, the um, audio brands. Um, one for Denon and one for Morant. So Morant is Ogata-san, Okata-san, and he is, uh, they, their characters are completely different. I think Dave, have you been over there and you met them, Dave, there? Sure. I know Frederick has. He's a, they're two completely different characters, but, they, but they're the ones that after a product is designed, whether it's Morant or Denon, they submit it to the sound tuning team and they go through and they will listen to it. And before they give it the stamp of approval to put that Denon or Morant's logo on it, it has to go through the sound tuners. And in the sound tuning rooms, lo and behold, have been um, Bowers, Bowers products. Because we had just, Andy had just talked about, do play it the way it is. <laughs> don't accent it, don't add more bass, don't add more. I need to know exactly what it is. So, and this provides a reference. So they know what that speaker sounds like, what those speakers sound like, and they continue to utilize those speakers to, to do sound tuning. And like I said, we go around all over um, Japan and other places, and we have this long-term relationship. In fact, um, our head of engineering, um, Brendan Steed for Sound United, the whole the big guy that's that kind of helps all overlooks all the brands. I just went over to his house and helped him set up a pair of 800s, and he's using two P uh, Marantz PM10s. So he's using one PM10 amplifier for the left and one PM10 amplifier for the right. So he's biamping so, um, each of the of the speakers, and it sounds um, absolutely amazing. So you can now not only Marantz. But also, also, um, if you look at Denon, Denon's Soundmaster also has in his labs and his spaces, you'll see Bauer's product. Um, so he's sitting there with his with the new 110 AVR, and behind me, behind me is the 110 integrated pieces. So I've been trying to hit up Eric. I haven't checked his email about a pair of 805s to go on those stands back there uh, to to play along with this with the with the A1 with the A110. Um, and only because I can only get the bookshelf. If I can get a floor stander in here, I would absolutely get a floor stander in here. So, so there's this history of our brands um, together. So, um, so Sound United as a company is passionate about about our our brands, all of our brands, and each brand um, we really want to make sure that they maintain their character. The best way to describe us, if you want to think about Sound United, is think of us like the Volkswagen Group. I like using that analogy. Um, Volkswagen owns Volkswagen, Audi, Porsche, Lamborghini, Ducati motorcycle, and a bunch of other brands. Each one of those brands still maintain their character. They're just owned by a group. Now, um, the benefit of being owned by one group is the each brand can focus on what makes that brand special. But there's some common things that need to happen um, for that a customer would expect. Like for example, for a car, you got to have airbags. You got to have navigation. You got to have power door locks. What separates a Rolls Royce from a Lamborghini is not your door lock or your or your the fact that your windows go up and down. It's the motor, the chassis, the um, the, uh, the 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 body, the design of the car. So why not have a bigger brand help you with the little details, so you can focus on the big ones. So maybe an amplifier for a subwoofer, or maybe a wireless module for wireless music, or maybe HDMI. So, so, so Dave, I think you guys have an experience with that with Class A, right? Yeah, that's a, you just uh, you just named uh, two of the most important things there. So um, uh, we are we are free to do all the things that that we want to do to make the product a, a true Class A product, and for the things that we would have to buy in. From somebody else anyway, whether it's a Wi-Fi module or a um, uh, an HDMI card, uh, we're able to go to the parent company and um, access the technology and uh, um, buy those things. Not only the latest technology, but buy those things at um, uh, at a, a, a tier one, you know, big company price. So we get uh, both the technology and a price advantage. 
Exactly. And that'll probably be hopefully the way that I think that that will happen with Bowers is um, the, um, the team will determine um, how can we assist <laughs> the best way to, to think about it. You do you, you do what you do best and let us know how we can assist you to be successful. It's cause, uh, and so that's one thing we want to stress. So when you see these brands become part of the um, Sound United portfolio, our goal is to maintain the character of the brand. If we didn't love the brand, we wouldn't have bought the brand. <laughs> That's the best way. You know, um, Volkswagen did not buy Lamborghini to make a Volkswagen. <laughs> they bought Lamborghini because they wanted a flagship sports car, period. You know, and they wanted all of the character that made their company has built their whole um, there's a philosophy about the design or how it's done, and changing that would affect the character. And um, so we want to let you know that if you're a Bowers fan, um, we're as big of a Bowers fan as you are. And you could see from these photos that the sound, our own sound masters would kick our butt <laughs> if we started changing um, how these speakers sound because they care about them as much as, as, um, as you do. So do we have any questions so far before I ask Andy to go into kind of the, the thought process, the overall thought or idea of how Bowers makes something? Actually, we do, Phil. We have a question uh, regarding the Nautilus. Uh, how many amps does it require to drive? Mm -hmm. I think so. Uh, I think we Eric... answered that one. No, four, four per side, so eight, eight channels total is required. As uh, Dave and Andy mentioned, they have active crossovers. So they're um, so you so in order to um, dial in that active crossover for the tweeter, for the for the mid range, for the mid bass, and for the mid woofer, you need four channels. Actually, Jen, just for kicks, put in a um, a poll. I'm not sure if you see it about what color. If you could have, if you could have a pair of Nautiluses, you would um, you would pick the overwhelming. Um, actually, the two top ones are um, classic black and Ferrari red. There's a kind of there's a little bit of British racing green in there as well. 19% saying British racing green. Uh huh. Huh, what color would I paint mine? Um <laughs> so, so yeah, but it's just but it's it actually shows that um so that's kind of a cool thing too. So um so so ask Andy, what color would you paint yours if you had the opportunity? Oh wow, okay, that's a difficult question. Um they look amazing in silver. Um I also uh, they're like Eric's story, right? I was in the factory one time where there was a guy who had three pairs all being done in different shades of gray he had a collection of different classic cars um and he, he wanted it in ferrari silver grigio which looked amazing um he had an, an audi he wanted it in that uh what they call it daytona gray color i guess i guess end of the day if you're gonna go, if you're gonna have something as spectacular and as wild looking as nautilus you probably just go for the the, the real mccoy so ferrari red and one particular <laughs> customer that we had um uh wanted a pair in uh, a period ferrari red so he owned uh, a 1972 daytona and um <laughs> he so he wanted the car and the color of his speakers to match you know apparently modern ferrari Rosso corsa is not the same subtly different to the original uh 60s and 70s period colors and obviously it's an older color as well racing red um, so he sourced the period ferrari red from that era plus the correct matching period uh undercoat color and supplied that to us so that we could paint it in the exact same correct tone of Ferrari Red to match his Ferrari. Yeah, what well, is a pride of ownership to owning any um, any speaker? Like when I asked him for a pair of um, 805s and he said, which color do you want? And I was like, oh, do I want the black? Oh, they're so beautiful. Do I want the white? They're so beautiful. They're, you know, because you know that this is something that's going to be a focal point in your room. So Andy, let's talk about some of these design philosophies or things that kind of that kind of go into who you are um as a company so okay so look i mean you you commented on it a couple of times rightly by the way about the the structures of the cabinets and the look of the cabinets and i think that's the important thing first to understand go back on that point we discussed i guess 15 minutes ago about the best loudspeaker isn't the one that gives the most it's the one that loses the least now fundamentally most passive loudspeakers out there Nautilus accepted work pretty much the same way and how they behave. So the, the principles, the concepts of transducers and cabinets are, are pretty established. It's known science. What we do is twofold. First off, obviously, develop our driving units, and we'll come into that later on and, and develop our own driving philosophy. But we begin 
with as much understanding as we can possibly put into the structure. And of course, over time, the abilities that we've had to both measure accurately this behavior of structures and also to then simulate rapidly uh, versions of those structures to refine them and get better have really, really helped our understanding. So essentially and simply put, the only sound that you should hear from any loudspeaker is the stuff that comes from the cones itself, from the radiating area. The structure that houses those cones as far as is possible I think we mentioned it earlier on in, in the case of Nautilus, should disappear. So that should be disappear in terms of acoustic impact. So in terms of the effect, as we said earlier on, that it has on, on how the energy gets out from the cone, what's referred to as cabinet diffraction or baffling effect. Mm -hmm. But also um, from a stiffness, mechanical stiffness point of view. Now, simply, uh, if you put energy or vibration into any cabinet, it will mm -hmm. at some point or another activate that cabinet. It will vibrate mm -hmm. through that cabinet and it will create resonance. Mm -hmm. Now, it's something like a guitar, well, that's a positive. That's essentially a contribution effect. That's why guitars and the woods that they're made of, or even more so violins, have a character and people value the different character of them. But we don't want that with a, a speaker. So we're, we're spending all of the effort that we can into trying to produce the stiffest, uh, most inert, most vibration-free cabinet form that we can. That's one of the reasons why we use curves. Uh, curve structures are very prevalent throughout our systems. It's one of the reasons why we use isolation systems such as decoupling i think you touched on it earlier on and we can go through that later mm -hmm. on if you like uh, and it's also even on some of our more affordable models like formation duo or 702 and 705 where we take the high frequency enclosure and put that into its own separated box which is a, a very distinctive mm -hmm. bowers and Wilkins technology called tweeter on top in the simplest sense i always say this and this is something i'm sure you'll be saying in future years if you don't really say it for why do people buy a pair of loudspeakers it's not to listen to loudspeakers right it's to listen to music they don't want to mm -hmm. hear the speaker and our job is to make the speaker disappear. So it's, it looks like it looks, all of them, mm -hmm. but let's go to those guys over, your, over my shoulder, I'll do what you did, the 800s, um, <laughs> because we want, we want them to disappear. So that curved system, uh, which is composed of multiple layers of beech wood, in the case of that big guy over there, it's 18 layers of beech wood, uh, mm -hmm. curved together to produce a structure which is incredibly stiff and incredibly inert, and then it's braced internally with a system that we refer to as the matrix, which we came out with a long time before Keanu, by the way. Um, and we used to brace the internal <laughs> structures of the loudspeaker and try and control vibration and resonance moving through the system. And then we overtop that with some even more inert component parts on top. So that headed assembly that you can see, which is that round structure that lives on top of the largest models, uh, we only deploy that on 803, 802, and currently 800 because you know they are flagship models. But we refer to it as the turbine head, and that's a, a single piece casting of aluminium alloy. Um, in, in, in European measuring, it's 18 kilograms, so I guess that's approaching mm -hmm. 40 pounds. Uh, incredibly stiff, incredibly inert, and what it does is it provides a supremely isolated enclosure for the continuum cone that lives within it to do its work. If you talk about the changes, I think Dave will vouch for this as well, uh, that in, in our parlance, in our world, that we've been able to experience in the last 15 years, essentially measurement technology and computing technology has so rapidly advanced um, our way of working compared to the old days. In the old days, if you wanted to do something like this, you'd have to physically prototype it. You'd have to make a mock-up, you'd have to try it, you'd have to work out if it was going to make sense, and if it didn't, you'd have to go back to square one. Now we can get a bunch of eval work done literally in 3D on a simulation package using FEA. Uh, so before we even get to the point of making something, we already kind of have a good idea that it's going to work. And that's mm -hmm. been brilliant from the point of view of speeding things up. Form follows function. Why does it have the, the, the tweeter and the woofer separated? And there's a reason why you continue to see this and that they just keep getting, they just keep refining it and refining it from ref and refining it from that very first um, 800 series that I showed you that Dave sold back in college when he was a struggling college guy eating top ramen all the way down to what they do now. Um, there's an there's a evolution to it. So this is aluminum. And you said, how much is this way? You say it weighs like so, 40 uh, something. 18, 18 kilos, 18 kilograms. So I guess it's about 40 pounds. Help me out. Anybody who does metric. Yeah, to <laughs> <laughs> we need a conversion. Yeah. You don't want the cabinet to speak. You want the driver to speak. Um, the, yeah, exactly. And then the, and like I said, the minimal amount of cone area or, or cabinet space around the driver means that you don't get the, I can't do it because I got this on, um, the put your hands in front of your face and talk. That's Yeah, that's so they, they refer to as the, as the diffraction effect. So exactly. So some of the energy from my voice is traveling across my hands right now. And if I take my hands away, you can hopefully hear a bit of a state of change if I do that. So that's exactly what's going on there. So yeah, pulling back the structure around the edge of the cone is, is really important. Something we've been doing for a very long time. Yeah. The best way to think of it is it makes the cabinet disappear. 
<laughs> because yeah. if the sound strikes the cabinet, you hear the singer and the cabinet. So you don't want the cabinet to vibrate because the cabinet is now distorting or smearing your sound. You don't want the sound to strike the cabinet as it comes into the room because you start hearing the, the, the effects of the cabinet and less of the effect of the, of, the, of, the, of the listener. So the goal is how do you design something to make sure that the, the cabinet interacts the least with the drivers and then you divide, design the best drivers possible. Now there's another thing that you guys do, you mentioned it, it's um, um, how it is attached to the top yeah. of the of the speaker. You call that decoupling. So can you talk about how you this one has the tweeter, the mid-range and the mid-range both decoupled from the from from everything else, correct? Yeah, correct. In fact, there are three stages of decoupling on the model you can see here. So uh, that's an 800. So the the tweeter on top assembly um, is floating. Um, so it has a single locating rod which allows for the cable harness to go through into the structure but also to make sure that the whole thing doesn't fall off. Otherwise, it's sitting on some very soft or low shore hardness uh, compliant mounts made from a material called TPE, which is thermoplastic mm -hmm. elastomer, which is compressible enough to cope with the mass of the system, but not so compressible that the metal will actually compress and meet the metal. Mm -hmm. So that essentially is floating. The reason for doing that, of course, is we don't want the energy from the larger cones below to vibrate upwards into the system. So essentially, think of it like the suspension system in a car. It's a compliant mounting. The head assembly, the, the turbine head, uh, which is the second component down, the larger one, that's doing the same thing. So again, it's got a single locating rod running through again to make sure that it doesn't fall off, but also to provide a kind of wiring harness run. So the main loom of wiring from inside the main body of the lower enclosure runs up through that. Um, otherwise, it's again floating. So it has three locating pads, one at the front under the chin, two at the side, and then a U-shaped section at the back. Uh, and essentially, again, that makes the whole system a fully compliant mounting. So clearly, as you alluded to earlier on, the, the, the largest amount of vibration that's going to go through the whole system is coming from the base cones, because fairly obviously they're mm -hmm. moving the most, they're generating the most frequency and low frequency energy. So that's the bit that we particularly need to kind of proof for. So by those two physical compliant mountings, we reduce the amount of energy going up through the system. The last thing that we do, and I think you just showed it there in that cross-sectional view, is, is the complete mid-range cone assembly is also floating so that's um living on a, a sprung mounting system so uh we've got the, the basket of the system uh, on a, a rod which is then coupled the back of the rod is coupled into the center of the turbine head on two fixing points and then the whole system is sprung mount so the cone assembly is floating inside the housing it's basically just making a very light contact around the edge and essentially the main reason for that light contact is just to make sure that it doesn't actually sink down uh, but mm -hmm. even those mounts are decoupled themselves to prevent uh, any sag on the basket of the system. So it's a fully floating mid-range cone inside a fully floating turbine head assembly sitting on top of uh, the low frequency assembly with a fully floating tweeter body on top of that. Exactly. So if you look as you work your way down, um, it's like, what am I going to do to, what can I do to make this speaker disappear and to provide, like I said, do no harm, um, do the, you know, um, we say do the least, <laughs> or how do, you, how do you explain that? Um, so not affect it, affect the sound the least possible to give yeah, you as close to reference yeah. to do the least harm. So, and as you see, if we go into speakers like the ones behind Andy, you'll see that um, in, in, in the Nautiluses. But even if you're looking at um, your budget isn't as big to get mm -hmm. a pair of 800s, a lot of these philosophies um, translate down into um, all of the other series as well. So even if you get into Correct. something like a 700 series, you still get this decoupled. The um, the high frequency driver is still decoupled from from the cabinet. So so that philosophy is still kind of works its way through, right, Andy? 100%. So I mean, as you can see right there, that's the 702, uh, and that's using the tweeter on top again in that fully compliant mounting that decoupled system. Um, but even if you mount the tweeter into the cabinet itself, so not in a separate housing. So even going right down to our entry model, the 607, uh, we're still using a compliant mounting. So it's done somewhat differently. The whole assembly is essentially living inside a low shore hardness or gel compliant mounting, and then it's coupled again to make sure that it's floating inside the baffle. But essentially, we're still we're still decoupling it. If you want to understand why, um, the, the best way to understand it is is I mean we we produce these and we can share them if you want. We have polar plots where you can look at. The difference between a rigidly coupled tweeter mounting in a box and a, and a compliantly or decoupled mounting tweeter assembly in a box and of course the perfect polar response of the drive unit moving forward into the room would be a nice smooth and consistent 
an edgy plot as it moves forward, a nice smooth and consistent arc. And if, if you rigidly mount it, you can see instead the effect of the side of the cabinet and it produces distinct kind of lobes or dips mm -hmm. in the response. Mm -hmm. So a certain amount of the energy of the tweeter goes forward and a huge amount of the energy is lost either side of it coming from that effect of being rigidly mounted into mm -hmm. the cabinet. The minute you go back to a decoupled mount, you restore mm -hmm. a lot more of that energy. If you then take that whole system and put it into a tweeter on top, so in other words, remove the baffling effect altogether, then you restore mm -hmm. even more of it. So it's measurable and it's provable is what I'm trying to say. As you said earlier on in, in that image slide that you showed, you know, our, def our forms are defined by acoustics. So we come up with these shapes. We're well aware of some of these shapes look beautiful. They certainly also look distinct, but they're there for a good reason. Mm -hmm. and, and and that also goes into the cabinetry. So we talk about the ca um, the cabinet needs to do um, can affect your sound. It's just the way it is. So the fact that you guys um, taking the multiple layers of you said it was birch and bending it is a lot harder than just cutting some MDF. <laughs> That's just a, you know. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, again, if you think about a regular wooden box, and I mean, obviously, we make more affordable loudspeakers using MDF, like everybody would do. But if you think about a regular wooden box, it's typically got mitered joint corners, and it's got four four corners, right? You know, one, two, three, four, just in that box structure. Mm -hmm. So a curved structure just inherently gives us the opportunity to remove some of those joints. Now, those joints, are, of course, are weak points, as you would know. I mean, if you've made anything in life, I'm sure you're well aware that joint is almost certainly the weak point between one interface and the other so if you look at an 800 it only has two joints those two at the back which couple up the back of the cabinet almost all of the rest of it is one single continuous piece of wood that just inherently makes it stiffer um what we do also in addition in in 800 is use these the system you can see there in front of you which we refer to as the matrix assembly so uh, what that's essentially doing is is coupling the internal structures of the sides of the cabinet left to right the front of the cabinet to the back of the cabinet the top of the bottom together as well and making sure that in all areas we're kind of reinforcing reinforcing periodic intervals throughout the whole system so what we're doing is if you think about it dividing up that large continuous section of the cabinet into a whole series of much smaller sections of wood and at mm -hmm. the same time stiffly coupling them to create uh, a significantly more effectively braced cabinet than we would have otherwise and again uh, goes back a long time. Funnily enough, um, some of you may not know, uh, Lawrence Dickey, uh, no longer with the company now, works in his own company, but Lawrence Dickey, who was the father of the Nautilus, uh, also invented the, the matrix assembly and developed that uh, in some of our loudspeakers prior to working on the Nautilus. So it's been around a long time, uh, mid 80s, and has again been hugely important in a lot of the products that we make to this day. So what are some of the questions that we actually have? Oh, we got plenty, Phil. Actually, the first one that came in that was of... Uh... Of interest is from Sumit Sumit Bagat. He wants to know the curvature. Uh, how do they achieve the curvature on the low frequency cabinets of the 800s? So you've got um, single layers of beach. So each one is 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 in itself a very pliable thing. And then we're laying it up in uh, an opposing grain orientation. So if you imagine you've got a layer of wood with a grain orientation running this way, then the next layer of wood is laid up with a grain orientation running this way. And then we build it up like that. And of course, with each layer that you add together, you increase the significance factor considerably. That's fundamentally how you'd make an engineered mm -hmm. wooden floor. There's a thin layer of glue between each layer of wood. So it's 0.9 mm -hmm. mil, so it's dispensed between each layer of wood and a glue roller. Uh, mm -hmm. As you build up the number of layers, the numbers of layers vary by the size of the cabinet because each cabinet, um, we have the same stiffness target, whether it's a small one or a larger one, but fundamentally we have to work harder on a larger one. So a small cabinet like an 805, has 12 layers of wood which is beach and then you have a, an inner and an outer so it's aesthetically uh, black finished paper on the inner and then an outer is whatever the a face is that the customer sees so that's either the painted surface which means we put a white surface over there and then we paint or apply paint to that or it's a wood veneer in the case of a rose nut so 14 layers and a small guy on a big one i think i mentioned it earlier on on the 800 we have to work the hardest on that because it's the single largest structure it's 18 layers. So at that point, it's made, but it's still not bonded together. To bond it mm -hmm. together, it goes into uh, the form press, the big form presses, which basically bend the wood. The biggest one mm -hmm. is Cambridge Dynamics K2, and that's the one that we use to form uh, the 800 in particular. Um, that's putting uh, 100 tons vertical and 80 tons horizontal of pressure. So the pieces mm -hmm. of wood are formed, laid on top of essentially a shape, which is the shape of the cabinet a structure and then the press pushes down as it pushes down the wood is wrapped around and then we push in from the side 
The whole system's heated at the same time as being pressed, so we're heating it to 90 degrees. Uh, and then it will sit there under a combination of heat and pressure for a period of time which depends on the total numbers of layers of wood. For a case of an 800, it's just over 20 minutes. On the case of one of the smaller ones, like an 805, it's approximately 14 minutes. So it varies by the numbers of layers of wood and the amount of glue that we have to cure off. Mm -hmm. After that, you open it up. The thing's fundamentally now in one structure. It has to actually be levered off the, the forming tool that it's now on because it's pressed to that shape. When you take it off, it's hot to the touch because it's just been heated to 90 degrees. So it has to cool for a period. Uh, and after that, you've created your your single piece uh, bent wood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and That's and so impressive. almost like the way that you do a guitar, like guitars are made that way too. They they take um, it's easy to bend thin pieces of material. The different layers it. also helps. They have different resonances, so they actually help cancel out resonances. And then they put that pre they press it. So if you think about a violin, or you mm -hmm. think about a um, a guitar or a cello or base that's how they're actually designed that the curve has a bunch of benefits like he's the, the shape has a bunch of benefits first minimize the front baffle so less of that diffraction the next thing the curve stiffens the chassis which and he talked about that eliminate those weak points the the edges or the points of a square box and lastly what dave pointed out it doesn't seem as big it makes the speaker seem less big um, you still, to make bass, you need, um, the, the one of the most efficient ways to make bass is a larger enclosure with larger drivers. You can do it with smaller enclosures and smaller drivers, but it's a lot more difficult to make a lot of bass to, um, at a higher output. So bigger boxes a lot of times can be a benefit, but bigger boxes also do not have high spouse approval factors, you know, and you don't want your speaker to dominate your room. Um, and this allows it to be small, appear smaller than what it is, and it also gives it a very unique look. I can add to that as well, Phil. There's another useful part of that. I think a big box is, is a very cost-efficient way of producing high fre low frequency extension, um, but it's also, depending on the construction of the cabinet, it's wasteful. So you. You know, a, large, a large drive unit and a large, relatively low-cost box, a lot of the energy from that cone is radiating the box. And we go back on what mm -hmm. we've been saying consistently over the last half hour, we don't want to do that. So you can actually produce uh, significantly more output with uh, a fairly stiff structure, uh, even if you've got smaller cones and what appears like a smaller cabinet, because you're not wasting yeah. any of the energy that you make. It's going out into the room. It's not being wasted on the box. Yeah. yeah. And there's some other things like you'll, we'll talk later about their subwoofers and some other things that move a huge amount of volume from a small box. But if you put your hand on the box, it doesn't move. You don't feel yeah. it moving. And that's one thing. That's a real simple demo that you can do to, to, to see, to understand the difference between a, um, a premium speaker. Take something that's very dynamic, with a lot of um, bass and and stuff going on, and put your hand on the cabinet, <laughs> along the top, along the side, along the back, and see if you feel the cabinet vibrate. If you do, that vibration is actually also bringing sound into the room. I could play something on those 800s, and you touch that cabinet, it's like it's just like the thing is not even on. So that's a that's a um, a very um, good indication of. Um, what you're trying to what you're trying to achieve there. Um, so we talk about there's a this, we go back to this form follows function. So we just talked a lot about the cabinet itself and decoupling and stuff like that. But if you build the best cabinet in the world, you still got to have good drivers, and those drivers have to be designed as well. And if you look at the speakers, there the the drivers look different. Um, not only mm -hmm. do the, does the cabinet look different, no, the drivers look different than what yeah. you would normally. Um, see now the first one I want to talk about and it had me totally interested was when I heard diamond dome um, mm -hmm. can you I was like no nah, it's not man what, what is that is that just a marketing term what is it actually made out of diamonds or what do you mean mm -hmm. by diamond so so this is another example of obsessive pursuit of do of perfection so can you talk about what this is Sure. So our, our tweeter designs for a long time now have uh, behaved bistonically. So what we mean by that is we don't want them to, to bend, deflect, distort um, as they move upwards in frequency. Now, what we found um, over time is that using increasingly stiff and light materials was the best way to achieve that. Um, so for a long time, we were working with aluminium domes, and we still do that to this day in our more affordable loudspeakers. Mm -hmm. However, as you started to get to a point where you were reaching the upper frequency of human hearing, 
even a well-engineered aluminium dome is starting to get into stress. It's starting to reach the limits of its, of its tolerances. So if we say 20 kilohertz, 20,000 cycles per second is roughly the upper frequency limit, depending on age, of course, if you're slightly older, that tends to roll off. But nonetheless, let's say theoretically it's 20. Um, some aluminium domes are already starting to enter a point where they're getting stressed at around that point. A well-engineered one might get slightly higher. Some of ours get to around 30. Uh, and some of our more recent ones to around 38 kilohertz, which is actually beyond that point. So it's not saying you hear sound at that point, it just means the system is not stressed in the range mm -hmm. where you can hear. The Diamond Dome was a research product to say, well, what happens if you try and produce something even more stiff? If you try and push away that point where the cone starts to get into stress, do you get benefits? Uh, and the outcome is absolutely that you do. So what it is, is an artificially grown diamond, it's done for us by a company called Element 6 in the UK. They're part of the De Beers Group. They're based in Ascot in the UK, not far from where we are here. Uh, we own the IP on the technology. They, they, they manufacture it to our specification. Um, so we co-developed it, in other words. Uh, it's essentially uh, taking carbon particles and injecting them into a superheated chamber. And I mean superheated like volcanic um, and highly pressurized. Uh, and then we essentially form uh, a very thin uh, diamond crust, which is some 40 micron. Uh, 40 micron is incredibly thin um, over the top of a silica substrate. The substrate is the shape or the form of the dome. So the dome shape, the frost, or so to speak, of diamond particles forms and descends, and as it cools and hardens up, you're left with this 40 micron membrane, a bit like an eggshell. What we do then is acid erode away the substrate, so you're just left with a very fine membrane. Uh, then we laser cut the edge to create the perfect shape, the perfect geometry, and the outcome is phenomenally stiff but also incredibly light and fragile. By the way, if you ever do get the chance to touch one of these, don't touch one of these, because the minute you touch it, they pop straight away. They don't have any. <laughs> um, but what they do do is, is behave themselves incredibly well. So they, they will go upwards in frequency before they enter any stress modes to 72,000 cycles per second, 72 kilohertz. So remember, just what I said earlier on, if you accept that the upper frequency limit is 20 kilohertz, these go up to 72. Now, people will say, uh, an, an obvious question, I'll army we've got you now, guys. Well, why if I can't hear anything up there? And, uh, the analogy is pretty straightforward. If you just designed a car to do 100 miles an hour and no more, what happens if you're driving that car at 99 miles an hour? You can pretty much imagine it, right? The engine's screaming, the gearbox is screaming, the smoke pouring out from under the hood, you're weaving across the road, you're, tr you're struggling to stay in control <laughs> because you're reaching the limits of the stress of that system, right? You're pushing it. Now, if you just design a dome to do the same thing, to just hit the upper frequency limit, then of course, as you go up in frequency, you're starting to stress the system. You're starting to load into it energy that it can't cope with. And what happens as a result is it starts to bend and flex. It starts to distort. If you design a system to go way beyond that, the analogy is to your point from earlier on, if you're, you're driving a Lamborghini at 100 miles an hour, and of course, as you're well aware, that means that system's not remotely stressed. You're cruising and the car's just completely in its comfort zone. It's nowhere near its limits of its, of its engineering systems, its tolerances. And that's the analogy here. So within the audible range, you can put a laser scanning vibrometer onto the system and you can find that the cone is behaving perfectly. And that was the point. That was the reason why we do it. Yeah, and that, and now there's some some like we can't there's there's different technologies that apply to the different levels of Bowers speakers. So yeah, we're correct. just talking right now about the flagship. If you look at the 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 the, the cone, um, it looks different. So now it is the tweeter look different, the chassis look different, but even the driver, the the mid base drive, these these big drive mid base drivers look different. Can you talk about continuum real quick? Yeah, so uh, Continuum um, was our replacement for a material that we now refer to as aramid fiber. Some of you might know it as a certain bullet resistant vest material. We, we no longer have the licensing rights to use that name, so I'm not going to use it here, but it begins with K. <laughs> um, so we used, it, we used it for a long time. Um, and, and the reason we used it because of its woven construction. So essentially, uh, a standard cone, a standard particularly paper or plastic cone, which is used in, in a lot of very affordable loudspeakers, has fundamentally an equal property of strength in both directions. It's isotropic in its behavior. So if you put um, an impulse into the center of the cone, energy propagates out towards the edge of the cone and goes forward into the room. Of course, what happens in a cone is it's suspended in a chassis in a system. So some of that energy will hit the edge of that cone and it will begin to come backwards towards the center of the cone. Just if you think about it in terms of a single impulse, one click, the sound goes out and then some of it begins to come back. And of course, one click is an incredibly boring song. So think about a song, of course, it's multiple clicks. So what happens is that first sound goes out, 
some of it comes back and as it's coming back it's meeting the next one coming out so you're getting a coincident point of the reflection of the first sound meeting the second sound coming out at the cone at the same time and that's noise which is what you want to try and get rid of so we've used woven materials in our mid-range cones for a long time because of their isotropic properties essentially what they do pardon me the anisotropic properties so what they do is rather than having equal properties of strength in both directions the energy goes out and as it is the edge of the cone some of it starts to follow the different directions of the woven parts of the material and propagate down those different directions so essentially we're breaking up a perfect circular standing wave reflection and turning it into a whole series of smaller pulses of noise so we're not losing the noise we're just massively dissipating it now that was where we were up to 2007 2008 when we first stumbled across the material which we still aren't going to talk about by the way because it's still a closely guarded secret um, that <laughs> forms um, the essence of, of continuum so continuum fundamentally works the same way it's still a woven material it's still a composite uh, what it does though is it stores a great deal less energy than the previous material that we use so as essentially the energy propagates out to the surface area of the cone and reaches the edge, it fundamentally behaves like there is no edge and it just keeps on going. That's why it's called continuum, because of course we're all nerds and it's like a continuum in sci-fi where the sound, where there is no edge. Yeah. You do have some sci-fi names, Matrix, Continuum. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know, there's a lot to live up to, right? Turbine, Continuum, absolutely, it's all sci-fi. <laughs> but that's where it comes from. So um, the Continuum Cone basically builds on the thinking of the established balance and movements process, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It works the same way as the cone materials as the speaker that, that Roderick has behind yeah. him. But the difference is uh, it's significantly lower in noise uh, even than that. And as a result, it's significantly cleaner sounding. Now, when we were doing the development work on it, um, which was from 2010, 11, 12 onwards, one of the things, of course, that was interesting is we were taking this new cone material and we were putting it into the existing cabinet forms because we had nothing else to work with. Mm -hmm. And that was very interesting because it was so much lower in noise, it was then exposing other issues that we hadn't previously heard other things that were previously masked by the noise in, in previous cone technology were suddenly becoming transparent because continuum was revealing so much more uh, which is in, in turn led to a lot of the work that we um, ultimately saw produced in the turbine heads fundamentally that design was inspired by the fact that we were suddenly hearing problems that we hadn't previously heard inside the preceding structure yeah, and and then if you if we talk about it, because we we're, we can quickly, you notice how we can quickly go through ninety minutes. Um, the cone material is different. The way that it's mounted in the chassis with the D yeah. cup is different. You don't see the normal speaker screw holes that bolt it hard to the cabinets to couple. The next thing is even the surround, how the the surround or how the cone is connected to the chassis is different, and then the chassis itself is 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 designed differently so every part of this driver is unique i mean we can have a whole 90 minute session just on how the driver design on mm. on on bauer stuff but the reason why i want to bring all this up is uh, whenever you do something that is this unique you're going to have to pay a premium there's a lot of companies out there that make um really good drivers that a lot of high-end companies just buy and they bend to their will by using crossovers and stuff and stick it in a cabinet if you go in and say no that cone material isn't right the way you attach that um that cone to the chassis i could do it better the way the chassis is designed can be it better and how i mount it to the box is going to be different all of that is completely bespoke and has to be done your way yeah. the fact that you're and because of that, you pay a premium for that. And the other thing about it is these speakers, Dave was talking about, and even if you look at Fredericks, he still has his old school 800. You know why? Because it's almost like going out and buying a classic Ferrari or, or Rolex watch or something like that. Yeah. You even, and when the new one comes out, there's a character, a design, you aspire to continue to own that. It's not like a phone where the new one comes out you just chuck it because now there's a four and now you want a five. You pick this speaker because you like the way it looked, the way it sounded, and you just there's the experience it provides. And that's one of the reasons why the Nautilus continues to sell because yeah. there's a character to that speaker that makes that speaker sound different than anything else. And it's because of the way how it just the drivers they use, the way they design it, 
um, and, and all and just the way it looks. So, so yeah, all I can of share that a great story with that. If, if you like, Bill, there was a perfect example of that. Um, I guess four years ago now, uh, a lady reached out to us. She, uh, her father was about to go into a care home. Um, he had owned a pair of uh, Bowser Wilkins P2 loudspeakers since 1968 mm -hmm. from new. He still had the original carton. He still had the original brochure. He still had the original calibration certificate, which you used to get when you purchased a pair of these loudspeakers signed uh, by John Bowers uh, in the early days to prove the measured performance of the loudspeaker. He had all of it. Um, and we bought them from him um, at a good price because we wanted to be uh, thankful for him. We also gifted him a pair of our then flagship headphones with a letter from the team at SRE just to say thank you very much for your devotion to our brand and you know we hope you can take a small slice of us with you as you go into your retirement in your care home and hope you carry on enjoying listening to us even if you can't listen to these big speakers anymore and we still have them here but they they work and i think that's to your point you know how many things do you buy from 1968 that 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 work still work you know, without having <laughs> exactly having and that you still totally want to work. work that you still want yeah. to work and you still want to enjoy and and that's and that's this just shows like i said the love of music for the people who buy them and the love of music from the people who make them and, and there's and and that continues whether that speaker is the first generation or the um or the latest generation there's a a love of the particular brands now now this continues on regardless uh, of you like we've just talked about the flagship stuff but for the last 10 minutes or so let's quickly go through and talk about your product portfolio mm -hmm. and then um after if people have to jump off um we'll stay another 20 minutes or so and answer um questions because i'm sure now the questions are going to start flying especially as we get into the the portfolio. So let's quickly go through and talk about the fact that Bowers can be found in a variety, makes a variety of different um, uh, audio devices as um, besides loudspeakers and have a large um, amount of partners that actually want to utilize um, Bowers um, loudspeakers in their products. So, so let's quickly, we've already talked about the Nautilus. Um, which is the icon, you know, if you, mm -hmm. you know, if you love it, you love it. Right. But we also, but let's talk real quick. We talked about the 800 series, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and you can see this is kind of their latest representation of the newest technologies that they have to offer. Now, um, and uh, I, I, whether you're a music person or you're a movie person, you, um, these, um, these speakers are great for those applications. Um, sometimes people want to hide them behind a wall. We'll talk about that a little bit longer later. But talk about the 700 series. Um, what, a, what a, you know, um, where does that live and kind of describe this this product? So our mid-tier, as you can see there, elegant performance. So uh, it's one of our most extensive ranges. So it ranges from a, a five-inch two-way uh, model called 707 through to the tower that you can see there, which is the full range 702. Uh, that particular one is a 702 signature, in fact, which is a special edition version with even more premium performance. So 700 series was created to try and bridge the gap between our entry level and our, our flagship range, as you can imagine. It's one of the things it does. It's 600, 700, 800. It incorporates more premium technologies. So some of the feature set that we've discussed during the course of this conversation, like decoupling on the mid-range cone, like tweeter on top, uh, you start to gain access to some of those things in 700 series. They're not available, um, particularly in terms of the mid-range cone or, or decoupling on Twitter on top in 600 series. That doesn't have those. Um, it also adds uh, more luxury in terms of the look and feel and the finish, especially in the premium model you can see there. So the signature models, which have this absolutely incredible Datuk gloss finish that you can see there. No two models are the same. Each is, um, is a unique model in terms of the design. It's very beautiful wood veneer. Um, essentially, uh, 700 series is the most adaptable range in in the sense that there's something for every application. So if you require a pretty small pair of speakers for use in a den uh, or a small room, or if you're very generous, perhaps in your, your kid's first audio system or something like that, 707 is the perfect choice. At the other end, if you want something that can be used in a theater application, you know, with a, a, a large center channel, a pair of surrounds, a woofer, mm -hmm. or be used with in ceiling or in wall application surrounds or in walls, if that's what you prefer then you know the 702 is the perfect choice for you. So three bookshelves, uh, three towers, two centers, uh, and also a matching woofer called the DB4S. It's a, okay. it's a very extensive bunch. Music lovers come in all different budgets, <laughs> and um, and that's where the 600 series comes in. So, so yeah, talk exactly. a little bit about these. So 600 series, uh, one of our most uh, long-serving, well-established ranges, second only to 800 series. So 600 became 
arranged in 1995. Uh, so uh, we just celebrated our 25th anniversary with a model range called the Anniversary Edition. Uh, value performance or affordable performance is, is the messaging here. So uh, you're cascading as much as you possibly can within the price point of the technology from 800s, the continuum cone, the cone material being the obvious thing you can see here. Otherwise, of course, you have to take choices, right? So it doesn't have an 18 kilogram aluminium turbine head or any of that other stuff because you just wouldn't be able to fit that within the price point. This is a, a standard regular and via wooden jointed box, but a well-engineered one, well-constructed. It still has decoupling on the high frequency. Uh, it's a three uh, strong stereo model range. So there's a five inch, the 607. There's a six and a half inch, which is the model you can see there, which is the 606. And then there's a tower, the 603. Uh, plus a matching center, and then we have a range of woofers to go with as well. It's very much the case of if you're looking for your first, you know, truly high quality, affordable audio system, um, this is the go-to, right? This is the kind of thing that sells in great quantity, particularly in, in European markets with things like uh, 6007 from Marantz, a uh, perfect partner for it, uh, or entry level from Denon AVR ranges used in, in 541 applications with the center channel. Great, uh, highly successful reviews that we've had on all of our products. Of course, we're pleased to say, but in this particular case, 606 is the current um, kind of affordable uh, speaker of the year, and 607 has also just had some great reviews and titles such as well, Hi Fi. Mm -hmm. AV Forms have also gone overboard with reviews on it from the 603 Theatre, which is our 5.1 package. So we're very proud of this affordable range. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the and the formation was was started because as people who there's a lot of times where you desire great sound but you don't have room for the big black boxes or the big silver boxes. Sorry, Dave. Yeah. But, but every once in a while, you want the sound, you want the performance, but you just don't have, or you may want or even desire the boxes, but there's no place to put the boxes or it's just logistically difficult. And that's where the um, formation comes in, correct? Yeah, exactly that. So, I mean, we were from the late 2000s producing a very high performance um, dock product called the Zeppelin, which migrated in 2011, 2012 into a wireless audio product, Zeppelin Air. Mm -hmm. And of course that grew and grew in popularity. I mean, at one point we were selling 100,000 pieces a year plus, it, it became a very successful part of our business. But the issue at that time was within the portfolio, we had nothing next for that customer to grow onto. Do you see what I mean? So if you'd grown up in an environment where all of your audio came on your phone or your iPod, and your, your conception of what an audio system was, was a, a self-contained plug and play unit with everything you needed in one component. How would you then make that transition step into you know, the world of wires and amplifiers and passive loudspeakers and all of those other things? So to keep that customer with us, rather than have that customer go to another part of the business and go somewhere else, we decided to come up with premium wireless uh, audio, which is where we've gone to with the formation technology. It's proprietary technology, wholly owned by Bowers and Wilkins. It's our own platform. It's extremely high performance. Uh, the synchronization left to right in the case of almost all wireless platforms out there, um, depending on brand, of course, is, is an order of uh, you know microseconds, so milliseconds, excuse me, so a degree of drift. Um, we are under one microsecond, so under one millionth of a, synchron a second synchronization between left and right loudspeaker. And that essentially means Perceptively, uh, your sound is as good as a wire from the point of view of, of the lack of synchronization drift between those products. Yeah. Now, that, of course, most obviously pertains to the Formation Duo, which is the, the, yeah. the two-way floor star bookshelf design that you can see there. But of course, it's also relevant if you're using a bar with an external base. So, of course, the synchronization between the sound bar and the base is, is hugely important to get that correct time alignment going on. Or if you want to add a pair of the smaller models, you can see there the flexes and use those on the surround channels as well. So. A very powerful platform. That's the range at the moment. Um, obviously, the interesting thing for us going forward will be to see how we can lean on on HEOS and understand how to integrate uh, what also is a very successful platform and so bring that in if we can yeah. to try yeah. and produce even more successful products going forward. Exactly. And if you're looking for a wireless pair of speakers for a great hi-fi experience, the reference for that, if you just want to have two speakers next to your fireplace in a beautiful home and you want the highest quality possible from that type of solution, that's where Formation Duo comes in. And then, of course, yeah. you have the headphones, um, which allows you, these are um, um, these are noise cancelling, correct? Are they, um, you have noise yeah. cancelling versions of these? Exactly. These are adaptive noise cancellation. So we started doing headphones in 2009-10 um, with a model originally called P5, and then that portfolio grew very rapidly. Again, very proud to say we've had a huge amount of success, both commercially and in terms of critical acclaim and reviews. And again, it's a great way for us to meet new customers and go through retail channels that we wouldn't otherwise go through. You know, 
head phones are sold in spaces that it's very difficult to sell an 800 into yeah. um, and that helps exactly. kind of build the brand and it helps build our, our our awareness and of course that's also vitally important from the point of view of connecting yeah. up the automotive thing yeah. which you're going to come to shortly yeah. this is the latest generation this is the px7 carbon edition so it uses a, a really substantial drive unit it's over 40 millimeter diameter it's pistonic or semi-pistonic in its behavior um, and it's mounted in a very rigid uh, carbon-braced enclosure to produce a very light but very stiff system that doesn't resonate. Uh, and then it's got a very powerful um, digital to analog converter, very powerful DSP, and fully adaptive noise cancellation uh, on board. So it's 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 the real winner. It's a very comfortable yes. sounding head for, uh, pair of headphones yes, to yes. wear as well. Yeah, and we'll come in and we'll go into another in another session. I'm gonna have Andy come back and Eric when his camera's not working, and we will go more about maybe do a, a mix and match. You know, this and this go. You know, it's it, this is your budget. Mm -hmm. Here's a good little combination of Morant and, and Denon and Bauer, so you can kind of figure out what goes along with it. Um, in addition, um, for that person who wants the big home custom home theater, um, they uh like you'll like you he mentioned that not only you'll see you uh, Lucas Films actually uses and Skywalker Ranch uses Bowers mm -hmm. um, there are systems that are designed to go behind the screens or in a traditional theater um, I've been messing with Eric about combinations to go into our space so um, this is just one of the ones I was thinking about it was like um, um, now he says this is kind of slumming it I mean this is great this is going to be better than anybody else's but he's but i was thinking ct7 something and he was like no ct8 no. so we're CTAs. probably going to go even we're going to go bigger the biggest thing is you see in the back of the room there's two big old racks that's just to hold the amplifiers that yeah. that would have to drive a pair of ct8s um in this space but this is going to be kind of our little reference theater um going forward so if you're looking for theater performance we ha they have a solution and we'll talk about that um doing the q a session after the, the thing is over the next thing architectural so if you want to take the performance outside there's a whole lineup of that which we'll talk about a little later and of course for those people who aspire um that love the brand um there's partnerships be with Automa with other companies including tv manufacturers like a couple of tv manufacturers like phillips but a big one is your audio um, partnerships with these major automotive brands. Can you talk about that for a minute? Yeah, thank you for putting a picture of my car on there. That's very kind of you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, seriously, by the way, I actually have driven one of those, and uh, it's an, all I say is it's an incredibly fun thing to drive, but it's a very difficult thing to get out of. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, you know what I'm talking about, right? This, this thing's like about this, car, this far like this, off the road. Like it's way down there, yeah. That's a 600 yeah. LT. It's a it's a very nice car. Um, so yeah, absolutely. We began um, well in our current partnerships for 2012 with Maserati, 2015 with Volvo, BMW, and then uh, McLaren are coming on board. Something like 75% of all McLaren cars sold since 2015 have had the premium Bowser and Wilkins audio system selected. Uh, one of the fastest cars in the world, the McLaren Speedtail, has. Uh, a five diamond, five continuum cone Bowers and Wilkins audio system and a central seating position. So it's a three seat car, left and right, and a central seat for the driver. Mm -hmm. This car gets from zero to 186 miles an hour in just under 13 seconds. Mm -hmm. I'll say that again zero to 186 <laughs> in just under 13 seconds. Nice. I think that's true. Um, yeah, and all the way through while you're doing it, you are surrounded by fundamentally five Bowser Wilkins 805s. So it's a, it's a pretty spectacular um, driving experience. But again, a great way for us to connect with new people and you know meet new customers and bring them into the brand. And of course, these customers are our perfect uh, secondary sale for things like the headphone product that we discussed or formation product that we discussed. And of course, they're also premium influencers, right? So they're the kind of people who know people who might, for example, be interested in a Nautilus system with eight class A monos, for example. Yeah, and, and, I, and I will say that I, I started off um, as, as a lot of guys, I would ride my bike to the hi-fi shop, but the first time that I could really get a, some um, a decent, which I thought was a decent system, was to put something in my car, because that's what every young person started off with back in the days. And we would modify the car stereo systems because the ones that came even in nice cars, Dave will tell you back in the 80s and 90s, sucked. You know, so everybody yeah. went out and had to buy new head units, new amplifiers, new subwoofers. It didn't image. There was no sound stage, and you were making pods and kick panels and subwoofer enclosures and and all that stuff. And now, because of these partnerships with companies like um, with Bowers and BMW and Bowers and Volvo, 
um, I get in a lot of these cars. Like I went and jumped in a brand new BMW 7 Series with a Bauer mm-hmm. system in it, and there's no reason to upgrade it. All those things that I was pursuing when I was a when I was a young man to try to get the imaging stuff, these systems sound far superior because yeah. um, Bowers works closely with the manufacturer as they're designing the interior to make sure that this is the optimum sound for this space. So even if yeah. you went out and tried to do it yourself, most likely the system that is designed in conjunction with Bowers and Volvo or Bowers and, and Maserati or any other company is going to image better, give you better sound staging and a more accurate reprodu- reproduction of the music in that car than what you could do if you tried to go it alone. So for yeah. us old audio, hi-fi guys or audio car audio guys, the um, the desire to upgrade the systems in the car just means that I check a better box um, when I spec the car out compared to me going out and sending it to a to an audio shop anymore. So that's something that's kind of big. And of course, we talked about the partnerships with other companies like um, like these Philip TVs, which are like their flagship OLED, I believe, and it has a um, literally a um, a Bowers and Wilkins system. Even has the tweeter on top, which is Very kind of the signature. So. Um, we shall do more sessions where Bowers is included. I'll make sure that as we get into our, uh, we do a lot of sessions on speaker setup and and speaker configuration and home home custom integration. And I'm really going to lean on the Bowers team of technical experts. Um, and next time we do another speaker setup one, Andy, I would love it if you would come and hang out with us as well. Maybe we should just do one just on cabinet design or or the thoughts of a speaker designer just in general. I think that would kind of be a good understanding because every speaker designer is trying to achieve the same goal. It's just a different approach from each manufacturer. So I think that would be good to have um, you come for that. I hope that you have um, picked up a a little bit about the brand. Um, Like I said, we could have talked for a very long time um, about this brand because it's just absolutely fascinating. And I'm, I'm so happy that Annie agreed to to, um, spend a little time with us talking about the product. Um, I'd like, I have to say thank you for coming and attending and um, Andy and Dave and hiding in the background, um, Frederick and Johan and Eric, who got to be out of sight, out of mind. He wasn't there, so I couldn't poke at him all the time um, for, for coming and attending this session. As you can see, we're very excited about this brand. It has some very unique um, capabilities and its, um, its design is unique. And, and, and we will continue to make sure that um, Bowers still maintains the character of Bowers, just like we ensured that Class A maintains its character. Thank you very much for coming, and we will talk to you soon.